All right, this week I'm going to do a study answering some objections here from a Jewish rabbi. I had somebody post this as a comment, and I really liked some of these things here, these attacks on Jesus Christ. I don't like attacks on Jesus. I'm just saying they brought up some interesting points here, and so I thought I'd do this sermon to answer this. And uh, it's Asfontein 1, August the 18th of 2014, and uh, he says, got this answer from a rabbi. Okay, and then he goes into the requirements for a Jewish Messiah. Now, before I get started, I want to just make a couple points here. Number one, I am not an enemy of the Jewish people. Okay, I do not teach replacement theology. I am not for what happened to the Jews down through the centuries at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, my spiritual ancestors suffered too at the hands of Roman Catholicism. So I am not an enemy of the Jews. Okay, that's very important that I get that out there at the very outset. If you are a Jew and you're looking for the truth, and you are open-minded, uh, then you don't have to fear here, I'm not your enemy. Okay? Um, so I want to say that right at the very beginning, because I know that there's a lot of bias out there, and it's it's true, and, and you know the prejudice against people that are Christians, because a lot of Christians hate the Jewish people. I'm not one of those. All right? But well, we're going to look at the Bible today. And I'm going to show you verses in the Old Testament and also New Testament to show you how they relate New Testament to Old Testament. So first of all, he says here, requirements for a Jewish Messiah. The Jewish Messiah won't be worshipped and won't be divine. That's what this rabbi said. Okay, um, chapter and verse. Where in the Old Testament does it say that the Jewish Messiah won't be worshipped and won't be divine? Let's go to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, okay, it says here, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Um, now correct me if I'm wrong, but that sure sounds like uh, the Messiah is going to be divine. You know, he'll be called the Mighty God, capital G. Uh, he's going to be divine and he's certainly going to be worshipped. You know, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Those are his titles. But he's not going to be worshipped. So the Jewish rabbi there, uh, I think he struck out on that first point. Okay? Now, what follows after this is confusion between the first and the second coming. And that's what the Bible teaches. The Old Testament teaches that the Messiah is going to be rejected the first time. We're going to see about that. Okay, there's not this thing, this this confusion here. This this rabbi confuses this whole thing of second coming verses with first coming, and he says Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah because these verses here had to have been fulfilled at the first coming, as soon as he showed up, and Jesus didn't fulfill them. We're going to see that as we go through these verses here. Uh, no, that's not true. Okay, there are two comings. We're going to see about that today in this study. So, he starts out here. Uh, the first point that he says, the Sanhedrin will be reestablished, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26. So go in your Bible there to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26. It says, And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Okay, now let's reread the context here. Verse 25 down through 27. And I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. And I will, I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. Okay? So, did that happen with Jesus when he showed up the first time? No. It's because the nation of Israel rejected him as their king. He came, he offered it to them, he offered the kingdom to them. You look at the early part of the book of Matthew, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. 
the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. He's offering the kingdom to them. They rejected him as their king. You say, well, then the, the kingdom's put off and he's never going to, to go back to the nation of Israel. And, and uh, he took Christians now and they've replaced Israel. And No, no, no. That's replacement theology. That is a satanic heresy believed by the Catholic Church. And that's why they've been against the Jews from the very beginning. That's why Adolf Hitler persecuted the Jews because Adolf Hitler was a Catholic. Okay, and again, people say, oh, you're crazy. It's historical fact, all right? Most of the high-ranking officers in, if not all, of the high-ranking officers in Nazi Germany were Roman Catholic. And the teachings of Roman Catholicism are replacement theology, that the Jews are no more. I don't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. If you have that teaching, it's not coming from the pages of the King James Bible. But this passage here, you say, well, why didn't Jesus fulfill it? Because they rejected their king. They said, we don't want our king. And so he died to make payment for sins. We're going to see that too as we go through this study. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. That's why he had to do that. That's why, and there are Old Testament prophecies all through the Old Testament about a lamb having to be slain and that that blood would take away sins. A perfect lamb. Jesus Christ is the perfect lamb. He is the one that came and died to pay for your sins. I mean, think about this. If you're a Jew out there, if you are a Jew watching this, how do you pay for your sins? By good works? By having a son that can pray for you after you die? Pray for the 11 months or 12 months and things like this so that you can get out of hell or whatever if you're bad? Sounds kind of Catholic to me. Kind of like uh, praying for the dead, you know, the prayers for the dead to get them out of purgatory. Hmm. Maybe you ought to examine the Bible here and see that that's not there. Okay. But uh, let's continue here. So what do we see there, the first one? They say that had to have been fulfilled at the first coming. No, that's going to be fulfilled at the second coming. And we're going to see this as we continue. Isaiah chapter 2. Okay. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is where we're going to go next. But he says here, the Jewish rabbi says, Once he is king, leaders of other nations will look to him for guidance. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. Okay, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of of the Lord. Okay, so you see that. Now you say, well, Jesus didn't bring it in the first time, so he can't be the Messiah. Again, see, so you're forgetting about the second coming. Don't confuse first coming with second coming. Jesus Christ, when he comes back, he fulfills these scriptures at the second advent, right before he sets up the millennial kingdom. Second advent, when Jesus Christ comes back down, we read about in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. He sets up his kingdom, then you go into the millennial kingdom. Matthew chapter 25, you have the judgment of the nations there. When Jesus returns and he judges the nations. And that's why there's no war anymore. Why? Because he is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. That's why. Again, you know, if you've never read the New Testament, why don't you open your mind and read it? Why don't you just be you know, a little bit open-minded and read the New Testament and see if it lines up with these Old Testament scriptures. That there is a first coming and a second coming. But we're going to show you that as we continue in this study. And by the way, I'm going to show you something else at the very end of this study. And I know here on YouTube you can skip ahead and watch the end and stuff like that, but I encourage you to watch the whole thing. I'd, you know, my studies are long. Why? Because we go through a lot of scripture. I'm not going to be standing here giving you my opinions and, and just reading two verses of scripture and then talking for another hour and a half. I don't do it that way. We go through a lot of verses here. And so I encourage you to watch the whole thing. But if you want to go to the end of the sermon 
you're going to see that Jesus Christ is the only one that can be the Jewish Messiah. It is not physically possible for a, a mortal man, a mere man, that's what I was going to say, a mortal man cannot be the Jewish Messiah. I'm going to show you why at the end of this study. But let's continue. Okay, so we had there that the leaders of, of other nations are going to come to him for guidance. True for the second coming, not for the first. Um, next he says here, the Jewish rabbi says, the whole world will worship the one God of Israel. Isaiah 2 verse 17. So let's look at Isaiah 2 verse 17 through 22. Okay, it says here, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. Now look at this. Here's where it gets interesting. Okay, Because you say, well, the New Testament's a totally different book. It's not really related to the Old Testament. We're going to see about that. Look at verse 19. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. And for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Seize ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Okay? So, you say, well, how does that, what does this mean? What does this line up with? Well, if you go to the New Testament, if you have one, go to the New Testament into the book of Revelation. You know, I heard uh, Rabbi Mordecai Kraft the one time, and I think very highly of him. I uh, was very impressed with his study on the you know, hidden language of the Hebrew alphabet. That was just really amazing. And I heard him say the one time about how that uh, there are, there's only one prophecy in the entire New Testament and it didn't come true. Uh, well, that shows quite a degree of ignorance of the New Testament. Okay, Because I'm going to show you here, this is a prophecy that lines up perfectly with what we just read there in Isaiah chapter 2. Let's look at this. Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. Now remember what we read there in Isaiah chapter 2? We read about how that they're hiding in the, in the caves and they're taking their idols and they're throwing them down into the holes and things to get rid of them. They're scared to death of the Lord when He returns. Look at this. Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Remember when... It said back in Isaiah chapter 2, it said about the, the Lord shakes the earth terribly. Right there it says, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's the earth being shaken terribly. You read back further in the book of Revelation, and it actually says that there is a mighty earthquake. You know, and all the, all the nations, all the cities are, are falling in things. It's a really bad earthquake. And ironically, if you study, I've actually heard some things from uh, uh, geologists and stuff, and they say that... All these earthquakes that are happening all around the world could actually eventually trigger a mega earthquake, the likes of which this earth has never seen before. Lines up with the Bible. Both Old and New Testament, too, by the way. Okay, uh, there again, let me just say this. A Bible-believing Christian does not throw away the Old Testament. Okay, a lot of Roman Catholics do, a lot of other cults do, and things like that. A Bible-believing Christian loves the Old Testament just as much as we do the New Testament. Okay, the Apostle Paul said about the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Okay, the things that happened to the nation of Israel are just as good and true for us today as Christians. We can learn from the mistakes that happened that the nation of Israel made. All right, so again, I'm not attacking the Old Testament. I'm not putting down the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a great source of truth, source of absolute truth. And I stand for every word in the Old Testament too. I don't change words in the Old Testament. But let's look at verse 15 here. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. It says, says here, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? 
New Testament prophecy lining up perfectly with Isaiah chapter 2. It's almost identical. The same things are happening. There's a great earthquake. The Lord's coming back with His wrath, and the people are hiding in the caves. Hmm. So we'll go on to the next one here, next attack by this Jewish rabbi. He says, He will be descended from King David, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, via King Solomon, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 8 and 10. So let's go to these verses. Revelation, or excuse me, yeah, I'm still in Revelation. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to see about this prophecy. The thing about the Jewish Messiah has to come through that bloodline there has to be a descendant. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So Jesse, of course, was the father of David. So this you know, branch that comes out of there, a branch shall go, grow out of his roots there. It's talking about a reference of the coming Jewish Messiah. What you're going to need to stick with me here, because at the end it's going to be very exciting. Don't jump ahead, just watch the whole thing, you know. Now let's look at uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 8 and 10. 8 through 10, excuse me. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 8. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou shalt... Or thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. He's talking to David. Verse 9, But a son shall be born to thee, and shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build an house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Okay? So you can see where this teaching comes from. That the Jewish Messiah would have to be a king that comes down through the lineage of David through King Solomon. Because see, David had other sons. So, you know, and they would have been heir to the throne as well. You know, you had Absalom, you know, trying to take over the throne of David while David was still alive. And, of course, that rebellion didn't go too good. He, you know, got caught in a tree by his hair, and they killed him, you know. But David had other sons. They all had a right to the throne, but God's choice was King Solomon. And, of course, unfortunately, King Solomon ended up turning against God and serving other gods. And, you know, that didn't work out too good. But God said here he's going to establish the throne of King Solomon, or of David through King Solomon and that lineage going down there. But something happens in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to see about that as we continue. Now go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Verses 1 through 17. We're going to see here this thing about is Jesus Christ a descendant of that line that comes down through. Okay, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Thamar, and Phares begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Naasson, and Naasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, or Booz, Booz, of Rechab and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Uzziahs, and Uzziahs begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias. And Ezekias begat Manasses, and Manasses begat Amon, and Amon begat Josias. Let me just stop there for one minute because we're going to get to an important name coming up here. But um, 
a lot of these ver a lot of these names don't line up exactly like they were in the Old Testament because Old Testament's Hebrew coming into English. This one is Greek. The New Testament's Greek coming into English. So that's why some of these names are spelled a little bit differently. Like, you know, Boa, Boaz, you know, Boaz in the Old Testament that married Ruth. But uh, let's look at the next verse here. Um, let's see where we at. Verse 11, And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. That's going to be important later. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat El Eliud, and Eliud begat Eliezer, and Eliezer, Eliezer begat Mathan, and uh, Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. You say, well, as Jews, we don't recognize the birth of Christ. You know, I have, I have a book here I want to be referring to in just a little bit, and it's interesting because they say BCE, they'll give a time, a date, in a BCE, you know, before the Common Era. You know, why don't you just say before Christ? Well, because we don't believe in Christ. Yeah, but you're still dating your calendar. You know, you're still dating time there by that BCE. What is the Common Era? You know, what did, when did that take place? Well, something came there, somebody came there, and that changed time. You know, and then the Common Era, you know, the CE, instead of AD, Anno Domini, you know, you say, oh, no, it's the Common Era. You know, come on. Quit being so hypocritical. You know, Jesus Christ came. He was here on the earth. That's why that time changed. But uh, verse 16 there said about Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So he was born of Mary and God the Father. You say, well, then Joseph wasn't his father. Joseph was his adopted father. See? So when people looked at them as a family, they didn't say, oh, yeah, well, there's Mary and that other child there or whatever. No, he's the adopted son of Joseph. All right. So there in that situation, he is part of that bloodline, part of that family. All right. But don't get ahead of me here because we're going to be looking at this as we continue. Because I know, you know, if, if you understand this issue, you're probably saying, Yes, but, you know, there's problems and things like that with Jeconias. We're going to get to that. Luke chapter 3. Go to Luke chapter 3. And here we have what is re in reality the genealogy of Mary going back to, uh, or, well, Jesus Christ, but it, it goes back through the bloodline of Mary. And um, Luke chapter 3, we're going to start here at verse 23. It says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And then it goes down through there. So Jesus was as supposed, you know, in other words, he's, that's what people thought of him, that Joseph is his father. Joseph was just his adopted father. You say, well, wait a second, I thought you said this was the genealogy of Mary, but yet it's talking about Joseph. And Joseph was not the son of Heli there. According to Matthew chapter 1, Joseph's father was different. He was not Heli. Who's Heli? Heli is the father of Mary. You say, well, then why would it say, you know, why are we talking about Joseph here in this thing? Well, very simple. Because Joseph is the son-in-law of Heli. And interestingly, if you want to study the, the customs and traditions there, when a woman uh, did not have any brothers, then her husband would become kind of the heir to the, to the family there. So there's no record of Mary ever having any brothers, you know, so that, and for that cause, Joseph became the kind of like the adopted son of Heli there, all right? He gets the inheritance that comes on that family because Heli didn't have any other sons to give it to. So who's he going to give it to? He gives it to his son-in-law. So he's called the same thing as being a son. All right? 
So you see that there. But now look at verse 31. Because it goes down through here. We're not going to read all these. But verse 31, which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Oh, no. Well, this presents a problem because Mary is a descendant of Nathan, not of King Solomon. Well, then it has to be the, the, the Messiah has to come down through the bloodline of King Solomon, not through Nathan, right? We're going to see about that at the end of the sermon. I know you're tempted to go towards the end right now, but just like I said, stick with it. But uh, interesting thing here, I'm reading this book right now called The Jewish Book of Why. I had a brother send this to me. It's, it's very interesting. I'm learning a lot about the Jewish customs and traditions. And this is, it's put out by Jews, you know. And I'm going to show some of this here in just a minute. But I want to read something here. What you say about this thing of, well, you know, what's this thing about, you know, Mary and stuff like this and, and you know, this, that, you know, she is basically a descendant of David through Nathan, not through King Solomon, but she's a descendant of David. So Jesus could still make a claim to the throne of David through that that bloodline that comes down through there. But what's this thing about that? You know, because some people would say, well, it's the father's bloodline. Well, not according to Jewish tradition here. It says, page 14, why is the religion of the mother the primary factor in determining the religion of the child? Jewish law considers a child Jewish if the mother is Jewish. Okay, it says a child is considered non-Jewish if the mother is non-Jewish, regardless of the father's religion. The rule was established because one can be sure who gave birth to the child, whereas the paternity is sometimes questionable. In other words, the father could be anybody. But if the mother is Jewish, and with the case of Mary, Mary is a direct descendant of David through Nathan. But... Who's the father? See, people back then would have been like, well, who's the father? You know, I guess it's Joseph. And some people say, no, actually it's God. And they go, what? You know, see, the paternity there, there were people that would have questioned the paternity of Jesus Christ, but everybody knew who his mother was. You can't fake who the mother of a child is. You know, obviously. If the mother's walking around and she's got the big belly, you know, and everything, and then the people are there, and when she gives birth and the baby comes out, you know, I think she's the mother. Can't really fake that. But it goes on to say here, why is the child of a Jewish woman who converts to another religion still considered Jewish? A child born of a Jewish mother is considered Jewish regardless of the future actions of the mother, mother or father. The child's Jewishness is considered his or her natural right, one that cannot be denied by the action of either parent. So the bloodline coming down from David comes upon Jesus Christ, and it's established because of Mary. The paternity issue there, yes, while that is important, the real one there is Mary. Okay? And it goes back, her bloodline goes back to King David. You see, but it's not through King Saul. It's not through King Saul. Jesus can't be the Messiah. We're going to see about that at the end of the sermon. I kind of quit saying that because I'm getting you all worked up and you're going to want to go to the end of the sermon just to watch it and then come back here again. I'm trying your patience right now, I'm sure. But let us let me show you here this book. I'll just zoom in here a little bit so you can see it. Okay, the Jewish Book of Why. And I'll show you the uh, copyright information inside there. Okay. And then I'll show you page 14. Page 14, right there, you see it? That's the first thing I read. There's the second quote I read. Okay? So you can look that, or you can pause that and, and read that if you really want to, and make sure I wasn't lying to you. But uh, good book. Enjoying reading it here. Anyhow. Let's continue. Next, the Jewish rabbi says, The Moshiach will be a man of this world, an observant Jew with fear of God. And he quotes Isaiah 11, verse 2. So let's go to Isaiah 11, verse 2. Isaiah 
chapter 11 and verse 2. It says here, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So, you say, well, that's a prophecy of the Messiah there, the Mashiach, if you want to talk, you know, speak in Hebrew there. Okay. Um, Jesus Christ fulfilled all those things. So what's the problem? You know, not a problem. And then he goes on to say, in other words, this must be accomplished in a human lifetime. That's what this rabbi said. Okay, um, chapter and verse. Could you give me a chapter and verse where it says that all the prophecies of the coming Messiah must be done in one lifetime? Can you show me that? Okay, and again, the first and second coming, that's where the problem is coming in here. This Jewish rabbi can't tell the difference between the first and second coming. And a lot of the Jews that are being taught by these rabbis, they can't tell the difference either. There is a first coming, there is a second coming. And Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecies of the perfect Savior that, was, that came to die to pay for your sins. He fulfilled that the first time. The second time when he comes back, he's going to fulfill the rest. He's going to bring in the kingdom. Okay. Next, the Jewish rabbi goes on to say, Evil and tyranny will not be able to stand before his leadership. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. Okay, let's read here since we're in Isaiah chapter 11. It says, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath, or breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, we're not going to go to Revelation chapter 19, but again, read Revelation chapter 19. He has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and he wipes out the whole Antichrist army. This army that's going after the Jews. You know, that they're, the Jews flee out into the wilderness, and the Antichrist army is coming out to wipe them out. And... The saints and Jesus Christ come down and Jesus Christ speaks and the word of God comes out of his mouth and just wipes out the whole army. Lines up perfectly with what you're reading here. Again, the New Testament is, it, it completes the Old Testament. Okay, it's not contrary to the New Testament. It, it is completing it. You got to get a hold of that. Now look at uh, verses 5 through 8. Here in Isaiah chapter 11, it says, In righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay. He said, well, Jesus Christ didn't do that the first time. No, what he's going to do it the second time. Okay. Again, we have a second coming passage here. When you go into the millennial kingdom is when this thing is going to be fulfilled. But let me just say this. If you say, well, I don't believe in that. That's ridiculous nonsense. Okay. You believe if you're Jewish and you believe what this rabbi is saying, you believe that the Messiah is just going to be a regular man, a mortal man born to two human parents. How on earth is he going to get the animals to behave like that? How could a mere mortal man just come down and make all the animals get along with people? He would have to be God to be able to do that, to gain control over nature and make nature, the animals out there, a lion, you know? eating straw like the ox, and all these wild animals and stuff like this. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf with the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And that's just a man that brings that in? Uh, no, I'm afraid that's going to be God that brings that in, and nobody else. God manifests in the flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not possible for anybody else to do that. But... Let's continue. Next, this rabbi says, Knowledge of God will fill the world. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. And we read that one. I will read it again here. It says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Again, very true. Okay, but uh, Jesus Christ is the one that's going to bring that in. Why? 
because John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is truth personified. All right, so he's going to be the one that brings that in at the second coming. Again, you say, well, no, it all has to be the first coming. All right, you can't prove that from Scripture. You're just assuming that first and second coming passages are all mixed together and just blended together, and it's one guy that's going to bring this in. And again, how's a mortal man? How is some man, I don't care how good of a guy he is, how's he going to get everybody to get along? How's that going to work? Okay. Now watch what they do with these next two entries. Okay, this Jewish rabbi. He says here, quote, He will include and attract people from all cultures and nations, Isaiah 11.10. All Israel, Israelites will be returned to their homeland, Isaiah 11.12. Now, there's a number that comes between 10 and 12. Does anybody know what it is? 11. Very good. <laughs> you say, well, why would they leave out verse 11? Let's look about that. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 10 through 12. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Okay, so the king is going to be Jewish in spite of what all these replacement theology Catholics think. The king is going to be a Jewish king, and the Gentiles are going to seek to him. But look at verse 11, that this Jewish rabbi skipped over. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, one, two, second time, to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Notice it says there in verse 12 that he is going to gather together the dispersed of Judah. If you read Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his throne in Jerusalem, he sends his angels out there, which I believe are the saints that are saved. He sends them out and they gather all nations and bring them to Jerusalem for judgment. And it says right there, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Lines up perfectly with Matthew chapter 25. Hmm. Again, the Messiah is going to be a mortal man, according to this rabbi right here. He's not divine. He's not God manifest in the flesh. Then how in the world is he going to bring all the dispersed people back to Jerusalem? Is he going to send out little invitations, little party invitations or something like that? RSVP or something like this? See, you have to accept the fact that your Messiah can be no other than God manifest in the flesh. No man, no mortal man is ever going to be able to pull all these things off. No way. No way. Even if there was some way he could try to gather all the Jews back to Jerusalem, you know, how's he going to get rid of all the other nations? Why are the other nations all going to come to this guy? And how's he going to get the animals to get along with people? It's just a regular man's going to do this, huh? Okay, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. You say, well, but uh, see, if, if Jesus was the real Messiah, though, he would have done all this the first time. I, I don't know how you can't get that there, Brian. Jesus has to do everything to be the Messiah. He has to do it all the first time. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. It says here, Jesus speaking in this passage, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. See, the first time Jesus comes, he comes as the lamb that's, to be slain, to pay for the sins. But when he comes back, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Interesting. And by the way, it's very interesting. I'm going to be doing some videos with this in the future. But the current flag of Jerusalem, which was established in 1949, you know what the symbol is? You say, well, the hexagram. No, that's the flag of the nation of Israel. No, the symbol on the flag of Jerusalem is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Interesting. There's also some very other, many other interesting things about this flag, which, like I said, I'm going to be bringing out in the future. But you see, the point is, Jesus Christ came meek and mild and lowly the first time to die for sins. And he offered himself as the king, but also as the savior. And he came and said, you guys can't make it to heaven on your own. You can't make it with your own good works like a modern day Jew believes. You know, you just do your best and you try to, to, to be a good person and everything else and stuff like this and keep the, the Torah and, and try to live by the, the traditions and the customs of our fathers and, and all this stuff. Jesus comes down and he says, that didn't really work. You know, Paul writes about it. He says, by the, by the deeds of the flesh, or by the deeds of the law, excuse me, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. And you know that. You know that. If you try to keep the law, you try to keep the Ten Commandments, you can't do it. It's a nightmare to try and live. What do you do when you mess up? You start over? How do you start over? I mean, you're going along and you're doing really, really good. You've made it to 12 years of your life and you've never broken any of the Ten, any of the ten Commandments. I doubt that highly, but let's just say that that's true. And you lie. What do you do? You bear false witness. You just broke one of the Ten Commandments. What are you going to do? How do you have a system of sacrifice to pay for that sin? Most Jews can't sacrifice animals. What are you going to do? Oh, well, you just kind of hope for the best. Well, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Okay? That's a hymn, by the way, if you don't know. Next, we're going to go back to what the Jewish rabbi says here. He says, Death will be swallowed up forever. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. There will be no more hunger or illness, and death will cease. Isaiah 25, verse 8. So let's look at that. Back to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. Isaiah 25, verse 8, He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Okay? Jesus did accomplish that in the first coming, but it will be finalized at the second coming. Okay, you see, what are you talking about? Well, did Jesus swallow up death and victory? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you know that there's never been any other Savior that was died and buried and rose again of his own power, you know? I mean, Lazarus came up, but it was because Jesus raised him up. Jesus is the only Savior that came back from the dead. Muhammad's still buried and dead. All the Jewish rabbis down through the centuries, they're all dead. The writers of the Talmud, they're all dead. And I put in Muhammad there. I'm not saying it, trying to compare him to the Jews. I'm just saying he's a cult leader. You know, Buddha, another cult leader, he's dead, buried. All these guys, all the popes that have ever lived, they're all dead and buried. You know, put them to bed with a shovel, worm food, you know, whatever else you want to say about them, pushing up daisies, you know. So Jesus did fulfill Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. He swallowed up death and victory. And as far as the Lord God wiping away all tears, or away tears from all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Well, that's going to happen at the second coming. So see, there are many prophecies of the Messiah that are first and second coming in one verse. Okay? Interesting. But, you know, you don't know that unless you have the New Testament and can rightly divide. And you can see, oh, okay, Jesus fulfilled that. He fulfilled this. That one there is going to be happening at the second coming. You can figure that stuff out if you have a New Testament and if you are saved. There again, if you're lost... What do you have to discern truth with? Traditions, church councils, rabbis, teachers, whatever else. But they're all fallible. How are you going to have the Holy Spirit of truth guide you into all truth? 
unless you can say that you're saved. John chapter 11. Into the New Testament. John chapter 11, verse 21. John 11, verse 21 through 28 says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister secretly, saying, The Master has come and calleth for thee. And we're not going to read the rest of the story, but you can read that. There, Lazarus comes up from the dead. Hmm. Interesting. And by the way, it's not, you know, that Jesus wrote this down to, about himself. These men, the disciples, were eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ. They saw it and they recorded it. That's what the four Gospels are. Okay? But you know an interesting fact about Jesus Christ? If you study it, when he was walking around on the earth, nobody died in his presence. I'm not saying that no one ever died at all in the time that Jesus was alive on the earth. I'm not saying that. But when they were there in his presence... No one ever died. So what this Jewish rabbi said here, death will be swallowed up forever. There will be no more hunger or illness and death will cease when the Messiah comes. Well, guess what? The Messiah, when he did come, when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, those things were true. He was going around. He was healing sick people right and left. Healing them. Why? Because he was the Messiah. Next, the Jewish rabbi goes on to say, All of the dead will rise again. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. So let's go there. And again, you know, we're, we're checking out these references. I mean, he's putting these references down. We're going to see if he's right. And we're going to see what they're referring to. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. They do come up. Now, is there a man that has that power, that he can do that? That people were eyewitnesses and saw him do that with a man that had been dead for a number of days? Uh, that would be Jesus Christ, raised up Lazarus from the dead. So again, and, 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 you know, again, you say, well, yeah, but I don't believe in Jesus. Okay, how is a mortal man going to do this? Cause the resurrection to happen. What's he just going to show up and he's, he's so holy God, the Father looks down from heaven and he says, boy, he's so impressive, you know, he's such a good guy. I'm just going to raise everybody up. I'm going to raise up all the, the dead, you know, Jews or saints or whatever you want to say. I'm just going to raise everybody up because that guy is such a good man down there. You really believe that? I certainly hope not. Next, the rabbi says, The Jewish people will experience eternal joy and gladness. Isaiah 51, verse 11. So, let's go to Isaiah 51 and verse 11. Isaiah 51, verse 11 says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. It says there, verse 11, Sorrow and mourning shall flee away when the Messiah comes. Why are they having sorrow and mourning? Well, maybe you ought to read Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, where it talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. And then read the book of Revelation and see that it lines up perfectly with that time. You know why they have sorrow and mourning? Because God has to pour out His judgment upon them for seven years, which you can read about over in the book of Daniel. Hmm. 
Why would God pour out judgment on His chosen people, the nation of Israel? To correct them? Why? Um, because they didn't receive somebody the first time that He came. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why a lot of the judgments are a third of this and a third of that. A third of the, the trees burn up. A third of the people die. A third of the creatures in the sea die. A third, a third, a third, a third, a third. Why? Because the nation of Israel crucified one third of the Godhead. The Lord Jesus Christ. The physical body there. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. Jesus is the body. The physical body. That's why back in the book of Genesis, God says, let us make man in our image. What is the image of God? Three and one, one and three, and the one in the middle died for me. <laughs> and I know, again, it's not scripture. That's just little rhyme and stuff like that. You can dispose of that if you don't like it, whatever. But let's continue. The rabbi says here, he will be a messenger of peace. Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that per publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Okay. Um, again, you know, how is this going to be a mortal man? You know, and, and really, is this really a prophecy about Jesus Christ? Well, I guess you can, you know, kind of make that argument, what we read earlier there, that you know, the Messiah is going to be called the Prince of Peace. So, he brings peace and he brings salvation, but uh, what is the salvation that he brings? Try your best, do good, be a good person, keep the Torah. Is that the salvation that the this mortal Messiah is going to bring? Hmm. Next, the Jewish rabbi says, Nations will end up recognizing the wrongs they did to Israel. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 5. Hmm. Let's look about this. Jump down to verse 13 there. In chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Hmm. Sounds like somebody fulfilled that prophecy when they died on the cross, when they were whipped and beaten. Verse 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Chapter 53, it says here to read to verse 5, according to this rabbi, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now do you know what this Jewish rabbi believes that these verses are talking about? You know what he believes? I read it there. Nations will end up recognizing the wrongs they did to Israel. So in other words, when it's talking about he, him, here, that's talking about the nation of Israel, not a man. You know why they believe that? Because there's no way to duck these verses. They line up perfectly with what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So you say, oh, it's not, a, it's not talking about a man there. It's talking about the nation of Israel. Now, you've got to be pretty desperate to come up with that as an interpretation of Isaiah chapter 53, the first five verses. You know, I mean... How about verse uh, 14 of chapter 52? As many were astonished at thee. You know what thee means? It's a singular personal pronoun. Fancy words. What that means is thee can only be referring to one, not a nation. How about his visage, visage was so more, marred more than any man? A nation? The visage of a nation is so marred more than any man? 
How do you get that interpretation? Well, you have to if you want to reject Jesus Christ. Because you read it and the plain interpretation of that passage would obviously be pointing to a man being beaten to the point of just being blood and guts, essentially, almost. I mean, just beaten to a pulp like Jesus Christ was. See, if you're trying to reject Jesus Christ, then you have to say, well, that's not referring to a man. It's referring to the nation of Israel. Ah, la, la. Uh, no, it's referring to Jesus Christ. And it says up there in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Remember it talked about the root of Jesse earlier on, the prophecy of the Messiah? Hmm. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The nation of Israel? Well, I've seen some video of people going to Israel and stuff, and it's not a ugly place over there. It's a beautiful country. A lot of beauty in that land. How could you make it a nation? How about verse 3? He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. You mean to tell me that everybody in Israel is sad? Sorrowful? There's no joy at all in Jerusalem or Israel? Come on. And acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. Okay, who's the we there? I mean, think about this. We hid as it were our faces from him. Um, isn't Isaiah writing to the nation of Israel? So how can he say, we hid our faces from the nation of Israel? That doesn't work. When it's saying, we hid our faces from him, it's saying, we, the nation of Israel, hid our faces from our Messiah, Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel, as a country, as a whole people, there, there were Jews that got saved in the first century. That's very true. There are Jews that get saved today. I hope that you're going to be one of them. But the fact is, the nation of Israel collectively, corporately, rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And they hide their face from Him. That's why you get a... Uh, see, we have here the Holy Scriptures. Okay? A Jewish Bible according to the Masoretic text. Right there. You get that thing? There's no New Testament in there. None. And I have a bunch of Hebrew Bibles too, by the way. Not one of them has the New Testament. Why? They hide their faces from them. And, I, you know, I've seen some of the Jews and stuff like that, and some are a little bit more, you know, kind in the way they handle people like me and, you know, that believe in Jesus Christ that are, that are Christian. But there are a lot of Jews that are very antagonistic, and they mock Jesus Christ. The Talmud said some very, very vile things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Hiding your face? Oh, but it's the nation of Israel. Come on. Come on. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The nation of Israel? I don't think so. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. It's like what I'm reading here from this Jewish rabbi. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Again, how do you make that the nation of Israel? With the nation of Israel's stripes, the nation of Israel is healed. So then you have to have stripes to be healed as a nation? How does this work? Go back to what this rabbi wrote here. He says, uh, The people of the world will turn to the Jews for spiritual guidance. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. So go to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Actually, we're going to look at verse 22. Zechariah 8. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 22 through 23. It says here, Yea, many people and strong nations nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold 
out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Hmm. It's a pretty good prophecy there. Okay. And again, when is it going to be fulfilled? You say it had to be fulfilled at the first coming. No. Again, you're messing up here. First coming, second coming. This is going to happen at the second coming. Okay. Back to what the rabbi says here. He says another point here. He says the ruined cities of Israel will be restored. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 55. So we'll go back to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 and verse 55 says here, When thy sisters, Sodom and her daughters, shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Okay? So again, you say, well, Jesus didn't fulfill that the first time. Well, I know that. That's why he's coming back the second time. Excuse me, the second time. And again, you say, well, it, but I don't believe that. I believe that our Jewish Messiah is not Jesus. He's going to be somebody else. Okay, how's he going to restore the cities? A mere mortal man comes. How's he going to do it? I guess maybe he'll have a, a good uh, subcontractor that he can get to come in and fix things up, right? Okay, next we're going to say here, the, the Jewish rabbi says, weapons of war will be destroyed. Ezekiel 39, verse 9. So go back, or go to Ezekiel 39, verse 9. Actually, we're going to start at verse 8. Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Okay. Again, second coming. Read Revelation chapter 19. The army of the Antichrist comes out to do battle. There they come out to wipe out the remaining Jews. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes back with his saints and wipes out their army. Okay. The birds come down. They eat all the dead bodies and things like that. But there's going to be a lot of weapons left. And you say, wait a second though. It says swords and spears and arrows, bows and arrows and stuff like that. You know, what are you talking about? You know, that's not modern day warfare. Oh, uh, well, you got to remember at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, most technology is going to be wiped out. And, you know, you get into battle and you have a AK-47 that's out of ammunition um, or an AR-15 that the, the firing pin busted. Uh, that's, uh, I heard a guy say the one time, a, a gun that doesn't work is a, is a poorly balanced club. Yeah, if you had a gun that's malfunctioned and doesn't have ammunition and whatever else, you'd be better off going with a spear or a bow and arrow. And that's why, again, you see, you know, a lot of these, this army is, a lot of them are on horseback. You say, armies on horseback? What are you talking about? Outdated bunch of nonsense and things? Well, again, there, you know, towards the end of the time of Jacob's Trouble, you might have solar flares going off and things wiping out electronics, how are you going to move a 200 million man army with tanks and helicopters? Those things have to be refueled. Horses don't. You go out on that horse there, oh, there's some grass. Let's go eat the grass. Okay, here's some water. There you go. Totally different weapons of war at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, we have a reference to the second coming, not the first coming. Next, the Jewish rabbi says the temple will be rebuilt, Ezekiel 40, resuming many of the suspended mitzvot, or mitzvot. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Okay, again, this is fulfilled in the millennial kingdom, not at Christ's first coming. We're not going to go to Isaiah, or Ezekiel chapter 40 and read the whole thing, but you see that, this thing of the temple being rebuilt. And it will be rebuilt, and Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from it. But first, the Jews are going to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, and the Antichrist... The man of sin is going to set up his himself in there to be worshipped. You can read about that in the book of Daniel, and you can also read it about 
about it in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet sitting in the holy place. And then you can also read about it in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, there. So there are multiple references in the New Testament to what's going on in uh, the book of Daniel. Next he says, uh, He will then perfect the entire world, world to serve God together. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Let's go there. Zephaniah 3, verse 9. Zephaniah 3 and verse 9. For then I will turn, for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Okay, again, he's proving prophecies here that relate to the second coming. And he's blending them and saying, oh, this all has to be accomplished the first time that the Messiah comes. Well, if that all has to be done the first time that the Jewish Messiah comes and the Jewish Messiah is not Jesus Christ, he's got a rather tall order. I mean, he's got to be rebuilding cities. He's got to get the wild animals to get along with people. He's got to be turning everybody back to one language. He's got to be restoring, rebuilding the temple there and getting everybody back into that system again. And he's got to turn away iniquity and he's got to cut off all the names of the idols. And he's got to... And a mortal man is going to do that? Come on now. Next, the Jewish rabbi says, Jews will know the Torah without study. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. So go to Jeremiah. And you know, this is, this is a very in-depth study here. This is not a quick sermon. Um, there's a lot of things we need to look at here. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now let's read the other verses down below that. Okay, that was verse 33. Uh, actually, let's go back up to the verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Hmm. You mean the Jews broke a covenant that God made? And that's not the Abrahamic covenant because that's everlasting. What was the covenant there? The covenant was that God's going to bless that nation. And he's going to make them a great and mighty nation. But they broke it. Why? They went after other gods. You say then God's all done with the Jews. Not hardly. Okay, Verse 33, which we read already, but I'll read it again. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How's that possible? Let's look about that. Romans chapter 11. See, the New Testament is a foreign book. It doesn't line up with the Old Testament. Oh, it lines up perfectly. If you're saved and you can understand it. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. Actually, let me just jump back here to verse 1 in Romans chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid... For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God didn't cast away his people. Very true for the first century, and it's still true today. But let's look here at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant. Remember he said I'm making a new covenant. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. You see how it lines up perfectly with what we just read there in Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 33. or thir Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. Excuse me. You see that? 
lines up perfectly. There's really no reason, if you're a Jew, there's no real reason to reject this book, this New Testament. If you accept the Old Testament, you really should open your mind a little bit and read the New Testament. Next, the Jewish rabbi says, He will give you all the desires of your heart, Psalm 37, verse 4. Like this is a thing that the Messiah had to do and Jesus didn't, therefore, you know, Jesus isn't the real Messiah. Well, we're going to see about this. Psalm 37 and verse 4. 37 verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Okay, you see, uh, Jesus didn't fulfill that. Oh, I think he did. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Say, is there a New Testament tie into that? Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know what I can testify to in my life since I've been saved? God has supplied all my need. Through who? Through what? Um, a, a belief that there will one day be a mortal man that will be the Messiah for the... No. Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And He provides all my needs. Mm -hmm. It might not be in the time that I want Him to sometimes, but He does provide them. Teaches, you know, he has to teach me patience once in a while. What do you have if you're a Jew and you've rejected Jesus Christ as your Messiah? You have, who provides your needs? You say, well, our Messiah will come one day and then he'll provide all my needs. Okay. How's a mortal man going to do that if he's not divine? Hmm. Next, the Jewish, or the Jewish uh, excuse me, rabbi says here, he will take the barren land and make it abundant and fruitful. And then he quotes, and he has in brackets here, Isaiah 5, 51, verse 3, Amos 9, verse 13 through 15, Ezekiel 36, verse 29 through 30, and Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. Okay? And all of those verses, we're not going to go through them because I agree with those verses. You know, those verses are true, and, and you know, certainly what he said there, he will take the barren land and make it abundant and fruitful. It's true. Absolutely true. But it's not going to happen by a mortal man. It's going to happen by God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, at His second coming and going in the, into the millennial kingdom. That's when it's going to happen. That's what the New Testament says. See, the New Testament gives you the account of Jesus Christ fulfilling the prophecies of the coming Messiah for the first time when He came to die for your sins. But then... Because the nation of Israel rejected, Jesus steps back and says, Okay, I'm going to have the gospel be preached to the Gentiles and to the Jews as well. And I'm going to put a, this time off of the second coming and restoring the kingdom. But when I come back at the second coming, then I'm going to fulfill the rest of the scriptures. So it's not that, you know, Jesus said, I come the first time and then there's going to be an end to my first coming and then the second coming and things like this. Um, if you want to get technical about it, Jesus Christ is still on the earth through the body of Christ. We are of His body. We are physically on the earth yet as members of the body of Christ. That's why Paul, when he was persecuting Christians, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus recognized the Christians down there as his body. So you see, the Messiah is still here through his church. And I don't mean Catholicism, for crying out loud. <laughs> don't put that on me. Don't try to link me up with Catholicism. I'm not a Catholic. All right? Jesus Christ is still here. So technically, he is still on the earth. But when he comes back down physically, he himself in the flesh, he's going to complete the rest of these prophecies that we see here in the Old Testament. That's the whole issue here. Now we get into another section with which this Jewish uh, rabbi said. Okay, He says here, 
Reasons Jesus wasn't the Jewish Messiah. Okay, the first reason he gives, he gives seven reasons. Interesting number. But uh, seven reasons. Reasons number one, reason number one, is divine birth slash divinity. The Jewish Messiah will be human. And then he has G slash D. They don't like to write the whole word God out. G slash D cannot become human. And then he, he quotes uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Hosea 11, verse 9, Ezekiel 28, verse 2, um, Numbers 23, verse 19. Okay, and he says strike at the end. Like this is a big proof here. So let's go to these verses. We're going to see about this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay? So then the, the concept is that because God is one Lord, then He cannot be God and Jesus. Well, you see, as I explained earlier, Jesus Christ is God three in one, okay? That means three parts, three equal parts. Now, you don't look at an orange and you say, well, you see, that's seed, uh, pulp, and skin. You don't do that. You say it's an orange. If you came to me and you said, give me one orange, you wouldn't say, oh, no, 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 no. No, I just meant the skin. I didn't mean the pulp and the seeds. No, it's three parts in one fruit. And so it is with God. Right? God is three persons in one being. There is only one God. Right? And Jesus Christ taught that. Jesus did not say, I am God and God the Father is God. No, 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 no. He was saying, when he would say, I and the Father are one, he was saying about the Godhead. There. John chapter 10, go to the New Testament, and I'll show you this. John chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 10, verse 30 through 33. Jesus speaking here, he says, I and my Father are one. See how it lines up with one God back there? I and my Father are one. Then, took, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Hmm. Not much has changed, has it? We have this Jewish rabbi here. He's saying the same thing. Still didn't learn his lesson. And you see, that's why I'm doing this study, because I want it, the Jews, if you're a Jew out there and you're watching this, I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is your Messiah, so that you don't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Then you'll get your proof that you want. Then you'll get to actually see signs and wonders and things, bad things happening. You'll get to see that, um, but it's a lot easier to get saved right now. God has a lot more grace for sinners right now than he will in that time of Jacob's trouble. Next, this rabbi quoted Isaiah 44, verse 6. So let's go to Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. You say, see? See? That's what God wrote, and Jesus would never say the same thing, would he? Let's look about that. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 1. Okay, it says here, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. 
John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was hmm, and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What do you have if you're an Orthodox Jew? What do you have that, that takes your sins away like that? How are you washed? How are you made clean? How are your sins taken away? Something to think about. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. We're going to see that later on. Okay, I think I have that in this study here. We're going to see that later on, that that lines up again with an Old Testament prophecy. They're going to wail because they're going to see that they were the ones that pierced him. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now we're not going to go down through there. You can read the rest of the chapter. And he says this over and over again. He's the beginning, he's the ending, the first and the last. Jesus Christ is saying exactly what was said back there in the Old Testament. Not because Jesus Christ is crazy or some other kind of thing like that. And by the way, when Jesus is saying this, it's after his resurrection, after he come up from the dead. Why is Jesus Christ saying that? Because he's the Messiah. He's the one that fulfilled the Old Testament. Okay? And he will fulfill the other aspects of his second coming when he comes back again. Now look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. The very, very last chapter in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Again, Jesus Christ speaking. So yeah, he does say that. You say the Messiah would say a thing like that. Well, Jesus Christ did. Now, Hosea chapter 11, verse 9, another one that the rabbi quoted. Hosea 11, verse 9. 